I am an introvert and full of curiosity. I thought that my personality would have no impact until one day it brought me to a strange and terrifying event. I usually observed the surrounding street from the apartment's window through the binoculars. Over time I enjoyed looking at the view of the warehouse below, across from my apartment and watching the scene of daily life here. I could secretly see a lot of people from the workers working in the warehouse to the women busy shopping across the block. Until the scene of children playing on the roadside, all in my eyes was a beautiful scene that I didn't want to forget. Seeing the world around me through the small binocular was a happy thing for an introvert and shy person like me. I could freely explore the interesting life out there through the binoculars. But this thing did not mean that my relationship with those around me would be affected. I was still popular with the neighbors who lived on the same block, and every day I met them I happily said hello to them. Then, like every other day, I would go to the bus stop near my house to catch the earliest bus to my workplace, starting a busy day at the office. I also found it interesting to sit on the bus like this when I could directly see the people around me glued to their phones instead of observing the surrounding life. Contrary to them, I didn't look at my phone too much. Instead, I liked to open the bus window and watch the street outside. On the bus I could see with my own eyes the old warehouse opposite my apartment which I always saw first in the morning when I looked into my binoculars. This time I no longer saw the workers working there but instead a girl in a red dress standing in front of the warehouse. The young girl stood facing the wall, looking very mysterious, but strangely the people around did not care about this girl's existence. She stood there for a long time not knowing what she was looking at but seemed very attentive not paying attention to the flow of people behind her. This thing also made me curious. I kept watching the girl because of the strangeness she radiated around and caught my attention, but then I also considered this a common thing. I no longer paid attention to the strange girl but continued to sit in my seat, calmly waiting for the bus to take me to the office. Day after day, my hectic work schedule made looking at the street through the binoculars less and less because I had to go to the office every day. I continued to the bus stop and waited for my first bus of the day. I continued to choose a chair close to the window so I could see the opposite curb and freely open the window, putting my head out to admire the scenery. I kept walking past the old warehouse. The warehouse still didn't open. The door was closed for days, but what surprised me was not the shutdown of this place. I kept seeing the strange girl in the red dress again. She was still standing in the same position with her eyes fixed on the wall. I began to be a little surprised and confused when I did not know why this young girl was always standing in such a position. The incomprehension unknowingly made my mind uneasy. Even though the bus had passed a warehouse, I couldn't help but turn my gaze to the strange girl. That night I worked overtime and got home pretty late. That's why I couldn't take the bus home as usual, but had to choose to walk. But thanks to that, I was able to walk past the old warehouse and meet the girl who worked at a restaurant next door. After greeting the girl for a few sentences, I continued to walk back to my apartment. The road from the warehouse to my apartment was only one intersection apart, so it didn't make me tired. On the way I also met many people including a white-haired older man walking in the opposite direction from me. After that, I passed the old warehouse again and continued to meet the strange girl who was still in the same position as in the morning. This time, I was able to see the girl with my own eyes to see her strangeness and mystery more clearly. I suddenly felt a bit cold when I saw a young girl standing with her face against a wall like that. I moved closer to the girl, clearly feeling her coldness. The girl stood like that for a long time. For fear of her finding out, I pretended to hold the phone as if I was texting someone. After that, I tried to make a phone call, but my eyes didn't stop moving toward the young girl. But thanks to that, I could see the abnormality of the girl. The young girl looked a bit sad, but her face was dim. I stood with her for a long time and then came back to my apartment. The following morning I sat on the bus again and passed the warehouse. At this time, I just asked people around and found out that this warehouse had stopped working. But what intrigued me was the connection between the young girl and the warehouse. I accidentally discovered something happening in front of the warehouse on the way. 
A crowd of people stood around, crowded in front of the warehouse. I didn't know what was going on, but I had a feeling something was wrong. I hurriedly signaled to stop the bus and then ran from the bus to the other warehouse. I felt worried for that strange girl. I didn't know what was happening to her. When I arrived, I saw the presence of the police. Everything was quite serious. A young man was escorted to the station by the police and the crowd. I came to the older man that I often met to ask what was going on. As soon as the older man saw me, he told me there was a serious case here. The police were hunting for the guy who threw the acid on the young girl there a few days ago, and the press was reporting it. I panicked, not thinking that the girl in trouble was the girl I had met before. I couldn't sleep that night, because I couldn't stop thinking about what had happened. I stayed awake until the middle of the night when I decided to search for the strange things. I started to open my computer and search for information on this case. It turned out that this young man had a crush on a young girl I met, but the girl had no feelings so she repeatedly rejected the guy. But everything would be okay if the young girl's refusal inadvertently made the guy feel hurt. Since then, the man had held a grudge, determined to take revenge and find ways to harm the young girl. It happened a long time ago, and until now the killer had been arrested. That dead girl was the girl I met. This girl died before I met her, and the scene of the crime was in front of the warehouse where I met the young girl. I was shocked to see the news and felt extremely strange and scared. After a while, my computer suddenly had trouble causing me to panic. Suddenly a clip was sent out of nowhere to my computer. The person in the clip was the girl in trouble. This time the girl called out to me and slowly turned her face to look at me, but her face was destroyed by acid, making me feel extremely haunted, so I quickly turned off the computer. But I still heard that young girl's voice echoing on the computer, so I ran away. I ran out of my room and headed for the stairs. While running downstairs, I suddenly felt someone push me from behind. I immediately fell to the ground from above in pain. I tried to get up, but my legs started to throb and I couldn't move anymore. I had to use all my strength to run away from this ghostly building, but the more I ran, the more I felt like I was lost at the starting point. In front of my eyes also appeared the figure of the girl in red. The girl asked me why I stopped following her and looked at me with a disfigured face. So I was scared that I couldn't speak. My whole body started to shake. But a moment later, the red dress girl disappeared. Because of that, I fell to the ground unable to regain my astral soul. Suddenly beside me appeared a voice calling my name. When I looked up, I saw the girl next door on the same floor as me looking at me with worry. The girl asked me because she was afraid I would fall down the stairs, but I could not answer. In my heart at that time, I was constantly afraid of the horror story with the dead red dress girl. I did not dare to sleep in my apartment that night but went to a friend's apartment to ask for shelter. The following morning, I met a colleague with the same interests. I called my colleague and told him what I needed to say. I advised him not to look at strange things anymore. I also had an amulet on my neck at that time, in the hope that I would never experience horror stories like this again. I worked as a ranger, so most of my days were spent in the jungle. I was driving to work in the company car and began measuring and photographing until late in the evening, after which I would return home. Chen, an unmarried middle-aged man, was the driver of my company. Chen drove me and my colleague to work as usual, set a timer to pick us up and quickly drove away. However, the sky was beginning to darken at the foot of the mountain today and Chen had yet to come back, causing me and my colleague great concern. My colleague waited in rage because if it got dark, getting out of this forest would be dangerous because the road was very rough. The car arrived after the sun had completely set. Of course, my colleague and I were both exhausted 
As my colleague carried his belongings to the car, he irritated the driver by being slow and late for his appointment. My colleague then sat next to the driver. Instead of apologizing for what he had done, this driver simply explained that he had a reason for picking us up so late. However, my colleague's reaction was one of curiosity rather than sympathy. Seeing this, the driver offered to buy this colleague a meal as an apology and promised to tell him the incident that caused him to be late. That evening, the driver drove my colleague to his home and ate a simple meal. His mother brought out a large plate of food from the kitchen. Because both of them had to work the next day so they couldn't drink much, just ate a simple meal with a bit of wine. At the start of the meal, the colleague inquired of the driver as to why he went to the forest so late today. The driver stated that he had been driving early, but on the way he came across a beautiful girl and assisted her. He was driving to the edge of the forest at the time, however on the way he was unexpectedly met by a person standing in front of his car. The driver rushed over and saw a young girl beckoning him with a towel, but she was alone as if she was lost. What struck him about this girl was the white handkerchief she used to call him and she appeared to be a girl from a recluse and traditional family living in the forest. He couldn't leave a young girl being alone like that in the jungle, so he went over to her, stopped the car in front of her and inquired about her situation. The young girl approached the driver gently and asked if he could drive her to her house because she was lost and couldn't find her way home. Seeing such a lovely young lady, the driver couldn't help but invite her to his car and ask for her address so that he could bring her home as soon as possible. After showing the driver the way, the two sat happily chatting side by side. The girl's young feminine beauty quickly captivated the driver, making him a little enamored. According to the young lady's instructions, the driver finally could take her home on the trail that led to the forest's end. She also told the driver that she was worried when leaving her mother at home alone. This made the driver even more smitten with the young lady. He couldn't take his eyes off her face. He kept looking at her and was always being caught by her. After a while, the driver also dropped her off in a residential area surrounded by vast fields where she could walk home. After that, the young girl went into her house, but the driver continued to keep an eye on her figure. He discovered that she had left items in his car. It was her white handkerchief. Perhaps she was in a hurry, so she forgot it on the chair. Because he was still busy with work and believed that this handkerchief was a predestined sign that would allow him to see the young girl again, he decided to keep it so that the next day he would have a reason to see her again. Hearing this, my colleague became excited, smiled happily at the driver and promised to accompany him the next day. As usual, the driver arrived early the next morning to pick up the colleague and the two of them set off together. The driver was supposed to take this colleague to the other girl's house first according to the original plan. However, I was in the car making the two of them feel hampered. When the other colleague noticed this, he immediately discussed with the driver leaving me in the forest and then go to the girl's house to return the handkerchief to her. That day, I had to work alone in the forest and the two of them returned to the old road to get to the girl's house. Upon arrival in the residential area, my colleague went to ask the neighbors for the girl's exact address. According to the description, the two eventually found a neighbor who knew the young girl's address and was eager to accompany them. The girl's house was at the far end of the village and the outside was deafeningly quiet. The two came up to the door and boldly knocked. After a while, the girl's mother emerged from the house and inquired as to what they were looking for. They both said, Come here to return the items to the girls in the house. However, this mother did not allow the two to enter the house and loudly chased them away because she suspected the two were imposters. When my colleague felt the situation was very strange, he immediately blocked the door and insisted on entering the house to meet the girl, but his aggressive demeanor frightened the elderly mother even more. According to the mother, these two were the impersonating scammers. The driver only recently confirmed that he was the one who brought this girl home yesterday. However, the mother did not believe it and even insisted that such a strange thing could not happen. When the driver noticed this, he immediately took out the girl's handkerchief to show her mother. 
When the mother saw the handkerchief, she immediately changed her attitude. Her face was a little sorrowful and she inquired as to why the two of them had the handkerchief. After that, the mother invited these two men into the house where they were surprised to discover the truth. The mother offered the two some drinks and thanked them for bringing the handkerchief back because it belonged to her deceased daughter. She couldn't hide her emotion as she looked at her child's handkerchief, breaking down in tears when she remembered her poor daughter. She stated that her daughter was in the forest a few days ago when she unintentionally stepped on a landmine and she could not survive. The villagers discovered the girl's charred black body but she couldn't close her eyes with peace because she didn't have her handkerchief. With the discovery of her daughter's handkerchief, the mother could finally use it to cover her daughter's disfigured face in the coffin and bury her. After telling the truth, the mother also sent the two men on the road late at night. The two of them left with a great concern about the fact that Chen had met the girl's spirit in the forest. After that, my colleague also forgot about it. He and I set out for the forest the next morning, but he refused to let me take the same bus that day. When the colleague saw the driver's emaciated appearance as he was getting into the car, he expressed concern, didn't know why his face became so haggard after only one night. He immediately recounted how he had trouble sleeping that night before when he dreamt that the spirit of the dead girl came to demand to bring him to hell. The girl appeared with her body covered in blood and worms, looked at the sleeping man and touched his face with her hand. He could feel the coldness of the girl's dead body, especially when her hand was passionately caressing him. The man awoke immediately and stayed awake all night because he was too terrified. Seeing this, my colleague tried to calm him down, ensuring him that nothing would happen. That day, the car and my co-driver unexpectedly rushed down the abyss and burst into flames. At the end of the year my neighborhood suddenly built an exhibition area. Just a few days ago the exhibition area had quickly attracted so many people. Most of the paintings here depicted women from many different countries with different expressions and nuances. Because the exhibition area just finished building, there was still an opening position as a night shift security guard with a fairly stable salary, so I took that opportunity to apply to work here, both to earn more income and to be convenient for my studies. After discussing with the manager, who was also an old security guard, in the morning I could rest and work the night shift. Because of the nature of my job, I would usually work in the computer room to watch the security cameras, do a few rounds of preliminary checks until the middle of the night, then start taking a nap with the manager. My first day at work began. At that time it was already dark and the visitors had already left. In the exhibition area, there were only me and the older security guard. He took me on a tour around so that I knew the way here and taught me things to keep in mind when working. He took me to a gallery hidden in a far corner. This gallery wasn't mentioned before, so it made me curious. He told me this was the owner's private gallery and the duty of the security guard that night was to strictly inspect the gallery. This was strange because I had never heard of or mentioned this mysterious gallery since then. But for a newbie like me this was not something I needed to worry about, so I just needed to take a look to know. In the middle of the night the older security guard took me to the secret gallery where people were not allowed to go without permission. The cold atmosphere in that place attracted me, but the security guard told me no matter what, when passing that gallery I mustn't discuss, comment or say anything, and especially, I should not go in there alone. The mystery of this gallery made me even more curious, I wanted to go inside once to experience it. I asked the security guard why there were such regulations here, but before he could reply, he received a phone call that seemed important. So before he could answer my question, he said he had an important job and he had to go out. 
After that, he went straight out of the duty room, leaving me alone in the room with many unanswered questions. In the meantime, I scrolled through my phone in boredom, but I didn't see him back until late at night, so I made a reckless decision. I slightly looked at the clock. It was past midnight. I knew that the other security guard was busy, so I thought about going alone to be able to rest early, later. No sooner than later, I grabbed the flashlight and left the duty room alone, heading straight for the secret gallery outside. Walking a few steps, I finally reached a gallery full of mysteries. The surrounding space was also strangely dark, which made me a little cold. I couldn't take my eyes off the door of the room. There was some invisible power that kept urging me to go inside, but then I decided to turn back because I couldn't stand the cold here. I had just turned my back when suddenly, a woman's giggle rang out in the room. I immediately returned to the secret gallery and assumed that someone was in the gallery. I decided to ignore the other security guard's advice. I brought the flashlight inside and carefully checked every corner of the room. But when I went inside, this room had nothing too special to attract me, but an empty room with nothing in it. Suddenly, I had the feeling that someone was watching me from behind with cold, blood-red eyes. I immediately turned around and found an oil painting hanging in the middle of the room, depicting a beautiful young girl fiddling with a favorite flower. I didn't know who the woman in the picture was, but the content of the painting was nothing special for everyone here to keep it a secret. I was impressed with the sad eyes of the girl in the picture. It seemed that in her heart there was an indescribable pain. After seeing the picture I was going to go back to my duty room, but at that moment the girl's eyes suddenly started bleeding. The girl looked like she was crying but her eyes were bright red which made me scared, shaking. After a while I felt like I was trapped in this gallery with a pool of crimson blood on the floor. It was like being drowned by the blood tears of the girl in the picture. The scene was so horrible that I couldn't forget it. The girl's tears suddenly turned fierce like a wave that wanted to wash me out of the room. After struggling for a while I thought I would lose my life, but I woke up and found myself sitting in the room on duty without knowing it. I screamed in fear and regained my composure. The other security guard saw that I was fully awake. He sat down across from me and asked why I was alone in there and if I had seen anything strange. I didn't hide it from him and told him the whole scene that I saw in that secret gallery. I thought that he would not believe me, but he reassured me and said not only me but the people who worked in the past, anyone who entered the gallery alone had the same problem. I knew it all started with the only picture hanging in the room, so I immediately asked him the origin of that painting. The security guard originally planned not to tell me because he was worried about me and he was too afraid to think about it, so after seeing my accident, he knew he couldn't hide it anymore. The security guard told me that in the past this painting was sold by a rich businessman who liked to collect antique paintings. Many rich people hunt for a painting not because of its content or because its creator was a famous artist, but because of the paint color used to paint this picture. The artist who painted the picture was called a mad painter, a pervert with a strong passion for painting. When making this painting, the artist felt unsatisfied with his work, so he devised a new way of mixing colors to make the picture look more real. He kidnapped young girls around the same age as the girl in the picture and secretly brought them home. After that, he killed the victims and then drained the victims' blood using it to color the paintings. He mixed the victims' blood into the pellet, used it to draw the first strokes of the work, as he thought the colors after being mixed with blood also became more vivid. In just one week he was able to complete the painting with emotional strokes but with sadness and a bit of gloom. Many people also say that when painting he would leave the victim's body behind, facing the painting as a way for the victims to see his work. The souls of the victims were killed by him accidentally breathed their souls into the painting, making the painting famous but also a way for the victim's souls to reside inside the painting. After finishing he had not time to enjoy and look at his work when the police suddenly rushed in and arrested him. 
the artist was later sentenced to death, but the case of the painter using blood became a hot topic of discussion everywhere. The painting had since been cursed as well, but it had been hunted by many rich people and passed on from person to person. The guards were on duty at night in the exhibition area. The guards were on duty at night in the exhibition area. If they went alone at night, they would be teased by the spirits of the girls in the paintings, threatened to faint, and because they were too scared, they then resigned. Therefore, the owner of this exhibition had banned anyone from going to the secret gallery alone, especially at night. The secret guard knew that I was also curious about the painting, but he specifically said that he would take me inside to see it in detail. This time, I went back. The picture was a little softer than the original, and no more strange things happened. I looked at the picture for a long time, felt the eyes of the girl in the picture as if she was watching me. After a while, the security guard took me out, ended the shift, and began to rest when it was almost morning. The painting is still there. Unfortunately, this was a beautiful work of art, but no one would admire it. It was a story that happened a long time ago in my village and I heard it from my grandmother on an occasion when I returned to my hometown. At the time, my family had a funeral. I went with my parents to my hometown to attend the funeral in a gloomy atmosphere. After the ceremony, I looked at my grandmother and saw her looking at the coffin with sad eyes. I was worried, so I went over to talk to her. My grandmother had lived in this village for a long time, so she understood everything that happened in there. She told me a very famous retribution story. When she was a child, there was a large migration in my village with people from different regions moving here. Among them was a family with three brothers. People didn't know how much money they brought into the village, but three brothers were able to build a large mansion on the east side of the village. Many people noticed and speculated that these three brothers were doing illegal business, so they hid there. I wouldn't matter if the eldest brother who did not know who to listen to invited these two youngest brothers to find an abandoned grave and worship in the attic for blessings and prosperous business. The three of them discussed going to the forest to find an abandoned grave because my village was a place of war at that time and there were countless abandoned graves. The following morning all three brothers blew trumpets and drums and then went into the forest to find an abandoned grave. Many people in the village did not pay much attention because they thought it was a religious custom in their hometown of three people. After entering the forest, one of the three found a grave covered with weeds, likely covered with a large mound of earth, but without a tombstone. All three brothers were overjoyed. They thought they had found an abandoned grave. They immediately performed the grave digging ceremony to bring the deceased's remains to their home. After worshipping, the three brothers blew trumpets and drums, brought the body of the person lying in the grave home and worshipped it like a family member. After the funeral was completed, the three brothers put the body in a large coffin and placed it in the attic with many offerings. This story reached the ears of the people in the village. They thought that this was a way for the three brothers to get rich, so they talked about it and demanded to learn in the three brothers' own way. Until one day, at the door of the three brothers' house appeared an older woman dressed in rags, hurriedly banged on the door with an extremely urgent gesture. The three brothers did not understand what was going on and opened the door. As soon as she saw the three of them, the older woman pointed her finger and said that all three had stolen her husband's grave. When the eldest brother heard it, he angrily chased the older woman out, thinking that the old woman wasted her mind talking nonsense and then stormed inside the house. The older woman was chased away, but she refused to accept it. She kept hugging her husband's photo, sitting in front of the three brothers' door to reclaim her husband's body. Curious people in the village asked about the story and learned the beginning and the end of the story. Everyone felt dissatisfied with the work of these three brothers. 
The men in the village, seeing this, invited each other to go to the house of the three brothers to claim justice for the older woman and reclaim the older man's body. Everyone rushed with sticks and rushed to ask the three brothers to return the older woman's husband's body back to its original position. At first, the three brothers always denied it, making many people in the village angry. People demanded to go to the attic to see the body for verification. At this moment, the three brothers revealed their true nature as delinquents. They used guns to suppress the people in the village. The youngest brother refused to negotiate with the people in the village, blatantly shot and threatened to make everyone panic. The whole village at the time was in an uproar, thinking that these brothers were thieves and robbers from elsewhere and determined to live and die with them. But with their aggressive nature, the three brothers still refused to return the body part and threatened to shoot anyone who dared to take the body away. While fighting and exchanging words, the older woman accidentally tripped on a stone on the ground and fell backwards. The fall caused the older woman to hit her head hard on the steps. She was stunned and died on the spot. The older woman's accident made everyone in the village sad. After knowing that the older woman died alone without children plight, the people held her funeral for her. Her body was placed in a coffin built by the villagers and a small worship ceremony was held. A single funeral took place in solitude in just one day. The older woman's body was buried by the villagers. Her grave was placed right at the older man's dug grave. Not long after the older woman's funeral took place, my grandmother often went with her great-grandmother to visit the older woman's house to smoke incense. The great-grandmother accidentally saw the older woman's husband's photo and panicked when she saw that his left eye was gouged out with a large hole. After seeing that, my grandmother was scared. The great-grandmother tried to comfort her. Then she explained that the older man had a broken eye in the past, so when making a picture of the shrine, they had to blur his damaged eye to avoid causing fear to those who were afraid to visit. Later, it was discovered that the older woman clutched another photo of her husband and carried it to the grave with her. Not long after, the eldest brother went to find a matchmaker in the village, bringing some money to ask her to make a maid for a beautiful young girl. Thinking that the matchmaker would agree with the money, the eldest brother was kicked out by herself and mercilessly cursed for the cruel actions of the three brothers before. The eldest brother could not persuade the matchmaker to leave with pity, but from then on, he became disgusted with the whole village. He went to the neighboring village to marry a stupid girl and then he held a lavish wedding to show his prestige to the people in the village. He then took his wife to live in this lavish mansion with his two younger brothers. After living for a while, the wife became pregnant. While the eldest brother's wife was pregnant, the middle brother also started to marry a girl from another village. Next, the youngest brother also held a wedding. The wedding of the three brothers all had one thing in common, which was to organize a great party, but no one attended but the poor beggars. All three still thought that this thing was a good action. After a few days, the wife and the eldest brother suddenly went into labor and was about to give birth. Seeing this, the eldest brother sent someone to find the most famous midwife in the village to deliver his wife's birth. His wife gave birth to a child very easily. She gave birth to a beautiful white son within a few hours. Looking at the red beautiful baby, the eldest brother felt happy, thanking the midwife that day. The first son seemed to take over the love of the eldest brother, but only after the midwife left did the child suddenly change. The eldest brother looked at his son in shock. He didn't believe that he would have to face this cruel truth one day. The baby just opened his eyes to look at his father, revealing a broken left eye, very scary and white. The eldest brother immediately invited the magician to ask him to check the baby's fate. After learning that this child was karma for digging the graves of three brothers, the eldest brother heartlessly left his child in the forest in the cold snow to die. The people in the village immediately spread the story of the three brothers who met with such retribution that they gave birth to a child who lost an eye. This story gradually became an obsession for the three of them, causing all three to continuously pray for the older man lying in the coffin in the attic for help. 
Day by day rumors were increasing that no one dared to approach the house of the three brothers. Their entire large mansion was also locked and bolted, not communicating with anyone, creating a dark and scary atmosphere. Not long after that, it was the middle brother's wife's turn to give birth. This time, the eldest brother found a shaman to ask for doing the expiration ceremony. But luck did not come to the unfortunate girl when the midwife said that the middle brother's wife had difficulty giving birth. After giving birth to a son, the wife began to bleed and could only choose to save the mother of the child. The husband immediately asked the shaman to come in and see that the wife was lying on the bed. The wife grabbed the shaman's hand, begged him to save his son and stopped breathing. The shaman was powerless to find a way to save the child's life and accept to sacrifice the mother. The death of his wife made the middle brother feel very sad, but he could only put his hope on his only child. The shaman stood outside and told the eldest brother about his family's retribution. But no matter what the shaman said, the eldest still didn't believe it, insisting that this was nonsense. It was not until the child was brought out that the shaman appeared surprised. He looked at the baby with a completely damaged eye. The condition was worse than that of the eldest brother's child. This child was born prematurely, so he died soon after and was buried in a deep forest. A mournful atmosphere enveloped the whole house, making many people feel suffocated. For a while, all three brothers discussed that they would bring the bodies of the middle brother's wife and son to be buried next to each other to save their grief. But no matter what he did, the middle brother still suffered from the insults and gossip of the villagers. Because he couldn't bear it anymore, the middle brother silently carried all his luggage and then quietly disappeared. The eldest brother then picked up his luggage and left the village, going to another place to live, leaving the youngest brother and his wife behind. As time passed, when my grandmother was an adult, she accidentally met my mother and daughter on the street playing with each other. The child was also very awkward walking. He walked unsteadily as if he couldn't see one side. My grandmother was curious, so she went to check it out and discovered that this child was the son of the youngest brother. The child turned to look at my grandmother with a broken white eye. Looking at the child's damaged eye, my grandmother immediately remembered the older man with a broken eye she saw in the photo on the day of the disaster in the village. At this point, my grandmother began to sigh, showing pity for the fate of innocent children. After that, Grandma said I have to live well, otherwise no one could help me. At this moment, I remembered the man I accidentally met on the street, curled up in the corner of the village, smoking with a sad, lonely attitude and a broken eye. I had a close friend. He was in the same class and also lived near my house. We used to play very well together, going home together after school. Until one day my friend stopped talking to me and went home alone without waiting for me. I tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't answer me. No matter how many times I called him, he kept silent. It wasn't until I touched his shoulder that he jumped all over, turning to look at me with a listless, panicked face. His face became thinner, more emaciated than before, like it was suffering from some disease. I tried to ask him about it, but he still wouldn't answer any questions. On the contrary, he went straight ahead, silently. His strange attitude confused me. The following day I went to class and saw his mother come to the homeroom teacher to ask him to take a few days off from school. I felt worried about my friend's health. So that afternoon, just after school, I ran to his house to ask. I went to his house after school. I knocked on the door for a while when his mother opened the door and invited me in. She also said that he was seriously ill. I asked his mother's permission to come into his room to visit him. After receiving the consent, I went straight to my friend's room. 
I found my friend lying on the bed in the room. His face was clearly worn out. He looked at me with a strange, soulless expression. I pulled up a chair and sat down next to him. As soon as he saw me, he brightened up a bit, but his skin still looked extremely pale. I asked him what was wrong, and he told me he was having a strange problem that kept him awake for many days. I listened to him and became more and more curious, asking what he was all about, why he was so haunted that he couldn't sleep. Until that time, he told me a whole story. A few days ago, he accidentally met a woman on his way home from school. That woman crossed the intersection at the corner of his house but was accidentally hit by a speeding car. After that impact, the injured woman lay in a pool of crimson blood and the car quickly sped forward and disappeared. He was a witness to the end. He also remembered the license plate of the car that caused the accident. Out of curiosity, he ran to see how the woman was. That woman looked up at him with her whole body covered in blood and weak eyes. She whispered to him. The woman used a weak breath and begged him for help. He called the ambulance and the police to help her. But when he saw the woman whose body was covered in blood, with her voice so weak, my friend also guessed that the woman would not survive. Instead of helping the woman, he coldly walked away. He was afraid that if anyone saw him, he would be the one involved in the accident. After that, he left the woman who got into the accident on the road and he ran as fast as he could home, pretending not to know anything. Since that day, he did not know about the news of the accident anymore, but he encountered some strange phenomena. Since then, his nature also became taciturn and quiet. His parents asked him no matter what he did, not bother to answer a single question. His skin became pale and paler. His eyes were black because of staying up all night and his body was also extremely weak. Every time he came home from school, he locked himself in the house, refusing to eat. He surprised his worried parents. As for himself, after he abandoned that woman, he always had the feeling that someone was watching him, making him extremely afraid. He also didn't know what was wrong with him. Every day the feeling that someone was behind him became bigger. Every night he seemed to have a fever. The whole body became cold and uncomfortable and the sweat fell non-stop. He kept dreaming over and over again one nightmare after the other that made him so haunted and terrified that he didn't dare to sleep again. In the middle of the night my friend was screaming in fear. His whole body was struggling as if to escape something. His body always felt heavy as if there were thousands of rocks pressing on him. It was difficult for him to breathe and move. After a while he felt like he wanted to die, clearly like someone was strangling him. He wanted to ask his parents for help but every time something happened he couldn't open his mouth or say anything. After struggling with that uncomfortable feeling, he finally could sleep again, but the strange dream always haunted him. This time, he felt everything very clearly. My friend thought that he was haunted by the psyche after that woman's accident, so he told his story to his mother, making her very confused. At first, he still tried to go to school, but every time he went out, he became tired, frustrated, and didn't want to meet or interact with anyone. Because of that, his learning was also declining day by day. That night he decided to tell the whole thing to his parents. He thought that he was suffering from psychological problems because he was so obsessed with the accident. After listening to him, his parents did not stop worrying and discussing how to solve his problems. His father reassured him and said he would take him to see a psychologist for treatment and try his best to comfort and coax him. The following night his father was so worried about him that his father decided to sleep in my friend's room for the sake of checking. But even if there was his father in the room, that nightmare still happened and scared him. In the middle of the night, his father saw him writhing in the bed. His mouth said something not clear, but he seemed very frightened. After a while, he returned to normal, but tears were already pouring down his face and saliva was running down both cheeks. My friend didn't dare to sleep anymore. He was afraid that every time he slept, that terrible nightmare would happen again. 
Daddy, help me! Ah, the nightmare is so scary! His father could only reassure his spirit that he could sleep for a while and be healthy to see the doctor. The following day, his father tried to stick around his bed with golden talismans, used to calm his spirit and ward off evil spirits. But these talismans did nothing to protect him. That night, the nightmare came back and it was worse than ever. He seemed to have lost all of his soul. He lay stiff on the bed with his cold body which made his father extremely worried. He finally couldn't take it anymore and went crazy, screaming all the time. His head began to appear in unpleasant pain. His health also deteriorated day by day. His mother was so worried that she cried all of her tears. She tried to do everything to help him but in the end she still could not relieve his condition. Meanwhile, his father went to see a psychologist for advice. His father was advised by his doctor to put a CCTV camera in his room for the doctor to monitor. His parents followed the doctor's orders and put a camera in his room that pointed directly at the bed. Every night his parents monitored him from the monitor connected to the camera to see how he was doing. Unknowingly during that time, his parents discovered the cause that made him like a person who had lost his mind. In the middle of the night he had another convulsion. But in the monitor, his parents not only saw him writhing in the room alone, but also another person. It was a hazy woman sitting on the bed, with hands clasped around his neck. Very scary. But at this moment, the strange woman discovered that she was being followed by the camera. She turned her bloody and horror face straight into the camera. His parents panicked and rushed to his room to check, but the woman was nowhere to be found, not even a trace. When his father saw this, he worriedly ran to the bed, trying to wake my friend up. After my friend woke up, he couldn't remember anything. He looked at his father bewilderedly and asked what had happened. His father worried that after knowing everything my friend was even more scared than before, therefore his father decided to hide this horror story from him. But then, his father knew that he couldn't hide it for too long. So, the father played the video he filmed in my friend's room for him to see. When the woman's face appeared, my friend immediately recognized it as the woman he had met. His father was surprised and asked him what relationship he had with the strange woman. He sighed and lowered his face. He admitted that he saw the woman in an accident at that time. She begged for his help, but he ran away. His parents then took him to the police to report the accident and learned that the woman did not survive because of too much blood loss. He also thought that part of the fault was because he didn't help the woman, so she died. So that night, he brought the votive paper to burn at the corner of the intersection. This place was where that accident happened. Then he reported to the police the license plate number and the specific time of the incident for the police to investigate. Fortunately, thanks to his testimony, the police caught the culprit of the accident. His health had since also begun to recover. A few years ago, I listened to the advice of a young man who lived in the same village as me about moving to the city to start my career. My first job was an assistant working on a construction site in a popular tourist area. I was also able to buy my family a new house in the city after a long period of hard working and savings. Since then, my life had changed as well, becoming better and better as a result of the curiosity and admiration of those around me. Actually, I understood why I was successful so quickly. It all started when I first started working on the construction site. My first days at work were always the most difficult compared to other people, lasting from early morning until very late at night. Working long days without rest exhausted me. A colleague recommended that I stay at the construction site with the other homeless workers to save money at the time. At night, 
I slept in the cramped dormitory right in the middle of the construction site where I worked, and I often stayed up until late at night because of sleeping in a strange place. I had a habit of going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, but the restroom was far away from the dorm. So whenever we needed to use the restroom, and especially at night, workers actually urinated right under the foot of the tree nearby the dorm. Our sleeping area was also surrounded by wild rocks, so no one else came around except for us. The other workers in the dormitory were all fast asleep at this point, but I was the only one who kept tossing and turning. I kept thinking about the strange thing I saw earlier. The more I thought about it, the more terrified I became. I was urinating under the tree at the time when I felt a strange cold blow on the back of my neck. Then I felt someone's hand slap on my back. I was startled, so I turned around to look behind me, but there was no one there. I was perplexed, thinking that a co-worker was pulling a prank on me. But even if I fooled myself, I wouldn't be able to stop worrying about what was happening to me. That cold hand rested on my shoulder again as I turned my back, along with the breath from behind. This time I immediately turned around to catch red-handed the teaser, but all I saw was a strange white smoke. That bright white smoke flew away as if it didn't want me to see it. I watched the smoke, saw it drift towards the forest behind me, and gradually the shape of a human appeared. I couldn't see the figure clearly, but I could tell it had a frightening face and glowing eyes. After that I turned away, attempting to finish quickly to return to my bed as soon as possible. I went straight to the dormitory after I finished, never looking back at the white shadow. But on my way into the dorm, I always had the distinct impression that someone was following behind me. I dashed into the dorm and slammed the door shut, not wanting the strange person behind me to come in. Finally, I rushed to the bed, letting go of the fear that I had been trying to suppress up until this point. But at that time, I couldn't get my mind off the strange white shadow. The next morning, I returned to the construction site to work, still thinking about the strange story that occurred to me. Our workers ate lunch at the construction site that afternoon, but because I was afraid of what happened the night before, I didn't dare to eat. Therefore, I wouldn't have to go to the toilet later. I decided to hide in the back of the dormitory, filling my stomach with a glass of water to satisfy my hunger so that I could work in the afternoon. Even so, I couldn't stop thinking about the strange figure I'd seen. I unintentionally glanced over clearly seeing that this was where I met the white shadow at night, and I became intrigued. I quickly stood up and went into the bushes to check. The first thing that caught my eye when I walked in was a large mound of ground that looked like a grave. There were no inscriptions or incense around this tomb, only a simple incense bowl made of sand and soil. I knew there was something wrong, so I quickly left before I got into any trouble. Then I went to find my manager, who was also a long-term employee here. As soon as he saw me, he put down his unfinished business and came over to talk to me. He knew that I was a newcomer. He answered my questions enthusiastically, even when I inquired about the grave at the edge of the forest. He was surprised at first when he knew that I found the grave. He told me that when his construction was just getting started, the locals discovered an ancient coffin. When everyone saw this, they held a ceremony in which they asked permission to move the coffin to the edge of the forest, then bury it, and worshipped it. When I learned about the incident, I became concerned and asked the manager where I could use the restroom without disturbing the deceased. The manager pointed to the back and said, The toilet is there and you can shower comfortably there. After that, the manager continued his business and never mentioned the coffin again. Since then, whether in the morning or in the evening, I'd walk a long way to use the restroom. We would have a weekend off and we were able to travel back to our hometown for a few days of vacation. I lived far away from home and I didn't have any friends or relatives nearby, so I decided to stay in the dormitory. The manager was in the same situation as me, so he stayed as well. I wanted to be close to him, so I went to the market to buy some food to cook some simple dishes. And then I asked the manager to join me for a few drinks tonight. The manager enthusiastically agreed. We had a great time that night because we didn't have to worry about going to work the next day. After drinking until midnight, both of us wanted to go to the bathroom, so we asked each other to go together. 
I immediately went after him. He took me to the grave where I saw it the last time. At first I thought nothing strange would happen if I went with the manager, but after a while the manager burst out laughing next to me. His entire body trembled as if he had been poked, which perplexed me. I had a feeling something was up so I took a look behind the manager. I clearly saw a hand on his shoulder at the time. The manager appeared to be aware of this so he made some jokes with the person behind him. After that both he and the strange spirit standing nearby laughed. I couldn't take my gaze away from them and unexpectedly being seen by the spirit. The strange spirit changed the subject and approached me. I could feel the spirit standing behind me staring at me but acting as if I didn't know that he was there. When the manager noticed my face changing color he said, hey you're drunk. Then he pointed to the dormitory and instructed me to follow him inside. As I walked I gazed back at the spirit. I could clearly see that he not only did not leave but also continued to look at me. I was afraid the spirit would follow me and the manager into the house. So in a panic I dashed inside and slammed the door. When the manager noticed this he was surprised and asked me what was wrong. I was unable to hold it anymore. I told him that I saw a ghost standing behind him. The manager stated that he knew it from the start. But because the spirit was a good person he had no fear and regarded him as a friend. I was surprised and intrigued. The manager asked me to sit down and told me about the spirit. He recalled that the workers were not immune to this issue. Every time they work someone touched their back. The workers brought this to the contractor's attention but the contractor did not believe them and threatened to fire them. This became a daily occurrence at the construction site over time and it would not go away until the grave was established. The workers here also joked among themselves that the deceased might have been too lonely to tease them. It helped to calm my nerves after I listened to it and he told me that the next time I go there I should just say hello and worship that nothing would happen to me. Then he told me that those who didn't harm the deceased would not face repercussions. As time passed the project remained solely my responsibility. However as the work was almost completed the contractor discovered the coffin. When the contractor saw the wooden frame of the coffin he realized it was expensive wood. So he took this piece of wood and sold it and the corpse was temporarily buried in that land. However after selling the coffin the contractor began to experience bad luck. He frequently became ill to the point of death and the money began to dwindle as well. Not only that but he also saw a ghost standing behind him at night. The contractor had to sell all of his assets in order to find a magician who could cure him. Later on I realized that the soul really just wanted to get to know me. Souls have no reason to harm us if we don't harm them. I'm Ben and I'm over 30 years old this year. I have a stable job at a small company in the city but because I needed more money to send back to my family at home I worked part time in the evenings after work. My job is to drive rental cars for people who can't drive themselves home because of the drunkenness or other reasons. I always go around the city in a small folding electric bike to find customers. Sometimes I also find customers through a website. After receiving the booking I ran the customer's address then folded my folding electric bike and put it in the trunk of the customer's car. Most of the guests were in a drunken state. I've been doing this job for a while so I've experienced many cases. Some people get drunk and then fall asleep without knowing what's going on. I preferred that because they would be quiet and not make me annoyed. And some people even though they were drunk still refused to sleep and talk a lot. Sometimes I don't know what they were talking about so I didn't know how to answer them. I just kept quiet or smile. Well that's what I usually do. After completing a booking I took out my folding electric bike and continued to go to other places. 
I clearly remember the story that happened that day while I was working. It was about 10 o'clock at night. After driving a customer home safely, I immediately received another booking. This booking seemed a bit far, but I still took it because I needed the money more. I called to confirm the booking. I checked the correct address of the customer. After that, I said that I would come as soon as possible. I immediately turned around and ran as fast as I could to the agreed rendezvous point after hanging up the phone. It was a relatively remote place located on the edge of the city next to a small river. It took more than 25 minutes from where I said goodbye to the old customer to the agreed rendezvous point. I was worried that the customer wouldn't be able to wait. Arriving at the place, I still did not see anyone there. There were no cars or people and no street lights, so it was very dark. I took the phone to call the customer, but there was no signal from the other end of the line. It seemed the customer had locked the phone. I called again and again to no avail. At this time, I was a little annoyed. After all, I had to run a long distance in a hurry because I didn't want customers to wait. But when I got there, I was cheated like this. But I was not too upset because this was not the first time I had encountered this situation. Perhaps because customers were drunk, they sometimes made a booking unconsciously and then disappeared or didn't accept it when I arrived. After thinking that, I also turned around and quickly returned to the city to take other orders. A few weeks later, I was eating cup noodles in my room and watching the news on the television. Suddenly a news show shocked me a bit. I was having a quick meal and going to be ready for a night job but had to stop to watch the news. In the news, the reporter was interviewing an older man about the case that was discovered this morning. He was the one who detected it, so they wanted him to report again on what he saw. Although the older man was shocked, he still explained the case very clearly. The older man's house was not far from this riverbank. Every early morning he used to have a habit of walking to the side of the river and stopping there for exercise before returning home. He did the same thing this morning, as usual. Suddenly he saw something on the river that made him panic. He then immediately informed the police. There was a car in the river. Someone lost control of the steering wheel and plunged into the river. Fortunately, the car was sunk not far from the shore so the older man could see it. Police immediately arrived at the scene and used a crane to pull the vehicle from the river to the shore. The driver unfortunately suffocated to death in the driver's seat. I was still watching the news intently. As soon as the TV came to the part of the license plate, it scared me because I remembered it so well. According to the autopsy, this case happened more than 20 days ago. After hearing that, I was even more surprised. I remembered this booking very well because it was cancelled and it happened only half a month ago. But if I followed the police, maybe I would encounter a ghost or something. I wasn't daring to think so much about it anymore. I still went out and continued my work. That night, I took bookings as usual. One of them was when I drove a young man home. He appeared to be drunk. The customer was sleeping suddenly. He woke up and panicked and told me to stop the car immediately. I was driving in silence, so that thing startled me too. I quickly asked him what was going on and he answered me in a very annoyed tone. He blamed me if I didn't see the injured person lying ahead of us, but asked me like that. He then got out of the car and walked straight ahead, seemingly lifting something. I looked at his gesture like he was helping someone from the ground and then walked towards the car. I thought he was too drunk to have such an illusion but he was serious and urged me to hurry up to the hospital. I felt a little funny so I told him that he was too drunk and I would quickly take him home to rest. But then he got even angrier when he heard that. He scolded me for being inhuman and wanted to hurry to the hospital. Then he turned to talk to the next empty seat in a real way. His actions were not the slightest hint of being drunk or hallucinating. That thing stunned me. He also pulled out a tissue and passed it to the side. 
he asked the invisible person to wipe the blood first. After seeing that, I still wouldn't drive away. He held at me to tell me to hurry up. I had no choice but to do as he said. Even though I didn't understand what was going on, on the way he constantly talked and gave a tissue to wipe the blood of the invisible person. His face was still worried. I glanced in the rear view mirror, still no one beside him, but the young man's appearance was very real, not drunken. I ended up taking him to the hospital as he wished. It was a long way from the hospital to his house, so I would ask for more money as soon as I finished. After arriving at the hospital, he was still talking to the empty seat. He opened the door to let the invisible man out. I also didn't know how to dissuade him. If the young man went to the hospital like that, he would probably be laughed at by the people inside the hospital, but he did not listen to my advice. Then I too got out of the car to get some fresh air, waiting for him to come back. At that time, I was also thinking about what happened, so I involuntarily looked at the back seat. The tissues from earlier were scattered all over the car's floor, but the scary thing was that they were actually stained with blood, just like what the young man said earlier was true. But obviously, I didn't see anyone in the car. There was no way I could be wrong. Could it be that the person who was hallucinating was me? Because it was clear that the tissue had blood on it. Or was I having bad luck again? Thinking about that, I remembered my booking that night. It was extremely scary. I quickly opened the trunk to get the folding electric bike and drove back quickly without notifying the young man. Then I got a call from him. It seemed that I was not the one who was hallucinating because the people in the hospital didn't see anyone injured either. He blamed me for not telling him the truth at the time. I just listened and hung up because I couldn't believe it myself. Although I had encountered many cases, this time was surely the weirdest. In mid-June last year, I started attending a university in the city, so I had to move into a dormitory. That day, in the city, the rainy season started, so the rain didn't stop all day. I had to carry my luggage alone in the cold rain. As I was walking past the flowers in the schoolyard, I accidentally stepped on a black umbrella. At that time, I wanted to find the owner of this umbrella, but I couldn't find anyone around. So I decided to bring this umbrella to the dormitory and wait for the rain to stop and try to find the owner of the umbrella later. But when I got to the dorm, I had to rush to change my wet clothes and prepare a place to sleep. Meanwhile, I hung this umbrella on the top and I completely forgot about its existence. After that, I started meeting my roommates and getting to know them and then went to the class for the first lesson. After a long day, I studied until late at night. When I was tired, I went to bed. Before I slept, I tried to change my rain-soaked clothes quickly and went to the bathroom to wash. After I finished washing clothes and returned to my room, I accidentally discovered that in the hallway of my room there was a faint black shadow. I thought someone was drying clothes, so I went out to have a look, but when I got there, no one was there. I tried looking around, but honestly, I was alone in the hallway. That made me a bit confused. Then I looked up at the black umbrella and thought to myself that I would return it the next morning. After that, I dried my clothes, went back to my bed and slept until the next morning. Early in the morning, my friends woke me up and they found out that I had a high fever. Because my roommate was worried about my health, she said she would ask for permission to let me take a leave and notify the administrator. After that, I decided to lock myself in my room and thought that it must be because of the rain yesterday that I caught a cold like this. While my friends went to their first lessons in class, I was lying on the bed and sleeping. But after a while, I heard footsteps echoing in my room. I could feel someone walking into my room and then across my bed and out onto the balcony where I hung my clothes. Then this mysterious person came in and stood beside my bed. She stared at me. I was startled and quickly turned around to see who it was. 
but I panicked when I saw a young man with a wet body standing next to the bed. In his hand, that young man was holding a black umbrella that I picked up in the flower bush. But the scariest thing at the time was the bloody disfigured face of the angry young man looking at me with fear. I screamed out in fear and sat up, shuffled behind the bed. I didn't know what to do. Seeing that, the young man put down his umbrella and put his hand on my side to push me into a dead end. After that, a young man used his hoarse voice to scold me for taking away his black umbrella. This horrible young man forced me to return the black umbrella that I stole, which made me cry in fear. While being pushed to the wall by the young man, I accidentally hit my head on the wall behind me. After a while, I heard someone calling my name. When I opened my eyes, I saw a woman in front of me. I woke up and sat up and saw that the manager of our room, she, was still looking at me with worry. She said my roommate told her I had a fever, so she came here to check it out and then asked me what I was dreaming about and why I screamed like that. I was confused and didn't know how to answer her. Then, she and I looked down at the ground. At the time I panicked to see the black umbrella that I hung on the balcony, which was suddenly now in my room. I remembered, so I panicked and told the manager that I had met a scary young man. The owner of this umbrella came here to reclaim it. She didn't say anything after listening, just silently picked up the umbrella and told me to follow her out. Her attitude at the time surprised me. It seemed like she already knew something. I followed her to the office and saw her leave the umbrella at the door and go to the table. She called me to the table and asked me to sit down and told me a story about this umbrella. The owner of the umbrella was a student of my school and lived in my dorm room. He was a person with a difficult background. His father was a gambling addict and left him to take care of his grandmother. Because of his family's difficult situation, this young man considered quitting his studies but he was supported by his teachers and raised enough money to pay for his tuition. The studious young man felt very lucky with that, so he studied hard and achieved admirable results. After that, he passed the entrance exam to my university and became the first valedictorian with the highest score in school ever since. During that time, he studied and worked on many different jobs to pay for his school fees. With his gentle and hard-working nature, he was very popular with friends and teachers, so everyone helped him with some money. But instead of taking the money, he refused because he thought that his savings from overtime could help him pay and leave the scholarship money to another friend with more difficult circumstances. Things started happening when entering the second semester at this dormitory. At the time, his father somehow found the dormitory and came here to find him in a miserable state. This man begged him to give him some food, because he loved his father so much, the young man couldn't send him away. After that, he went down to the canteen and bought his father some food and brought it up to his room to eat. But when he returned to his room, he found his father had disappeared without leaving a message. After that, the young man looked over his desk and saw that the tuition money he had worked so hard to save was gone. Knowing who the thief was, he and the school called the police. However, with the little information provided, it was difficult for the police to catch his father. His roommate at the time also said that they had some valuables taken away, but no one blamed him. Not only that, after the incident happened, his roommates continuously comforted and tried to help him through this difficult time. But unexpectedly, this became a shock to the young man. That made him taciturn, quiet and did not want to meet anyone. Until one day, the whole dormitory suddenly became chaotic after a loud noise resounded from the balcony. His teachers and friends were all shocked when they discovered that the young man had committed suicide in the rain. The corpse of the young man lay motionless in a pool of blood. No one would dare to come near him. At that time, the person who felt pity for the young man was the manager of the dormitory, who was also the manager now. Out of pity for the young man's plight, she used this black umbrella to cover him from the rain and keep the scene intact. She stood in the rain, covered him with an umbrella until his body was loaded into an ambulance and taken away. After the incident, because of the chaos, her umbrella got lost somewhere unknown and gradually drifted into her oblivion. She then asked me where I found this umbrella in surprise. At the time I told her that I saw an umbrella in the flowers in the dormitory yard. 
The manager got upset and said that's where the young man committed suicide that year. The heavy atmosphere between her and I was suddenly destroyed by a cold wind blowing across the room. We both looked at the door in surprise and saw that someone was looking at us. The manager immediately realized that it was the student who was in the accident when he was coming to claim the umbrella with his wet body. I was so scared that my face turned pale and I didn't dare to say anything. And the manager was so scared that she shivered. But then, she stood up again and walked towards the student. Her action surprised me. She suppressed her fear and walked over to hug the unfortunate student. At that time, all the resentment in the young man suddenly turned into a smoke that flew into the air. The young man then also disappeared and she collapsed on the floor. When I arrived, I found her body drenched, surrounded by strange puddles of water. Then she cried and whispered that he was a good person. After that, it was over and I didn't see that student anymore. My manager at the time continued to manage my dormitory and she was very popular with the students here. The black umbrella was still there, hanging by her in the office as a souvenir for the deceased student. This was a story that I witnessed with my own eyes when I was 8 years old. That summer vacation my parents were busy with business so I went back to my hometown to live with my grandmother. Grandma had a cousin who passed away. Because they were close acquaintances my grandmother took me to the funeral. To get to her cousin's house we had to go by bus. Since she didn't go out of the village often, Grandma asked a person on the street where the bus stop was. Luckily, as soon as we got there, the bus had already arrived. The distance to the grandmother's cousin's house was quite long. After sitting on the bus for more than an hour, my grandmother and I finally arrived. Everyone prepared a lot of delicious food. I ate while listening to the adults talk about funerals. It seemed that grandma's cousin passed away quite quickly. No one in the family would have expected that after just one sleep, they had to part with her. Their family had two older sons, so organizing the funeral was not difficult. Early the following morning, a group of people went to the cemetery to dig a grave. I was curious, so I asked my grandmother to come along. Their cemetery was on a low mountain outside the village. Each family in the countryside had its own cemetery. The deceased would be buried in the family cemetery. Entering the cemetery, the people with pickaxes and shovels began to dig. After watching for a while, I got bored, so I ran to the side to play. While I was reading the inscriptions engraved on the tombstone, suddenly I heard the murmur of people digging graves. I ran over excitedly, not knowing what happened. The grave diggers looked so worried. Everyone was bewildered when they saw the object lying at their feet. This was probably the first time they had encountered such a thing. When they dug to a depth of more than a meter, a large rock appeared on the ground and made it impossible for them to dig any further. Those grave diggers told the family that the rock underneath was too big to be dug out. The dead woman's husband heard this and frowned, but they couldn't do anything but find another location to dig a grave. However, one of the grave diggers told the family that it was bad luck to dig two graves. The older man was a little angry when he heard that. He angrily said that if the grave could not be dug, where would the dead be buried? The two people who were digging graves were a little confused but didn't know how to solve this, so they had to do as the older man said. After discussing it, the two of them dug another grave not far from the old one. A few days later the funeral was conducted. Many people came to offer their condolences to their families. Everyone was sorry for the sudden passing of the older woman. After completing the rituals, the son held his mother's photo and went to the family cemetery for burial. Maybe because the family was busy, even the first grave dug did not have time to fill it up. My grandmother and I went home after her cousin's burial, but unexpectedly just three days later, the family continued to report the funeral. The one crying at the door was the eldest son of my grandmother's cousin. I met him a few times at the funeral a day ago. 
My grandma invited him to the house, poured him water and asked him what was wrong and I listened at the door. The eldest son of the family took a cup of water, choking on what happened after we left his house. His younger brother was Taru. Taru was a construction worker. After the funeral ended, he also rushed back to his work. That day, Taro was pushing a cement truck when the newly built wall suddenly collapsed in front of him. By the time Taro realized danger was approaching, it was already too late. The bricks were now falling towards him. The bricks then completely covered Taro's body. Many people working nearby heard the crash and rushed to run. However, when the other workers pulled Taro out of the pile of bricks, he became a pile of shredded meat. Blood splattered everywhere. According to local custom, two funerals could not be held consecutively within a hundred days, so Taru's coffin was not brought home. The older brother had to bring Taru's coffin to his house, but before he could get through the door, his wife stopped him. The younger brother died, the mother also died, the wife's attitude was too harsh, the couple argued loudly about this. The wife firmly refused to leave Taru's coffin in the house for fear of bad luck. But the husband did not agree to leave his brother's coffin on the street. Taru's death was pitiful enough. The couple argued for a long time and the wife finally agreed to let Taru's coffin inside the house, but only in the backyard. The eldest brother also had no other choice and had to ask someone to push the coffin into the backyard. Taru's coffin was placed next to a large cage. The older brother was sad, but there was nothing he could do. Just like that, the coffin was placed in the backyard to wait until the day it was buried. Even there was not a simple funeral for Taru. Early the following morning, the wife went to the backyard to feed the pigs as usual, unaware that something terrible was about to happen. Before she had time to go to the backyard, she saw the pigs suddenly rushing out. Did she forget to close the barn door yesterday? The wife thought for a while and was sure that she had closed and locked the barn door carefully yesterday. How could they get out? Fortunately, the pigs did not lose any. The wife didn't think much of it and quickly brought the pigs back to the barn. However, not knowing what happened after that, the wife looked very panicked, shouted and dropped the bucket of pig bran on the ground. Her face suddenly darkened. A cold wind blew from nowhere, causing the wife to shiver involuntarily. It turned out that her pigs collided with the coffin after escaping from the barn, causing the coffin to overturn in the middle of the yard. Taru's body was now full of bite marks. The wife's screams made the husband in the house panic and run to the backyard to see his younger brother's body lying on the ground. He burst into tears and rushed forward. The husband was holding his brother's body sobbing and his wife was looking very panicked over there. After turning over the younger brother's body, the husband asked his wife to quickly help him put the brother's body back into the coffin. However, the wife did not want to touch the corpse. The wife's attitude and the fact that she placed the coffin in the backyard made the husband extremely angry. The wife then did not even admit her fault and said extremely outrageous words that made the husband unable to control his anger. The eldest brother could not bear it anymore, turned his head and scolded his heartless wife. Then he waved his hand and slapped his wife in the face with a very painful slap. The wife was a gentle person, never touching anyone, but this time the wife was too much. The wife covered her face with her hands and said he was an abuser, but everyone knew that the husband was only driven by anger to act like that. After saying this, the wife turned away and asked for a divorce. She kept screaming to let the neighbors know that she was beaten by her husband. The wife went into the house to get dressed, went straight to the door without saying a word. It seemed that she was thinking about going back to her mother's house. While walking to the railway section, she ran into a neighbor. Seeing that her face was swollen from the slap, the neighbor asked her about it. The wife was angry and ignored the kind neighbor. The wife even cursed under her breath saying that he was a talkative bastard. However, just when the wife was about to cross the track, the neighbor's face immediately panicked. He shouted and stretched his hand forward to prevent the other wife from crossing the railway tracks. It turned out that there was a train ahead. 
The train whistle was howling but somehow the wife still didn't hear anything and walked across the tracks. And whatever comes would come, the wife was tragically killed by a passing train. In just a few short days their family had to receive three tragic deaths in a row. It was really a rare thing. The eldest son choked up and told his grandmother about the successive calamities that occurred at home and asked for my grandmother's help with the funeral. Because the relationship between the two families was good, my grandmother promised him that she would arrange the family and help them take care of the funeral. Taru was buried in a pre dark side grave. As for the daughter-in-law, I thought it was the revenge of the younger brother.